Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on the Northern Lights and Winter Experiences with Discover the World. My name is William Gray. I'm a travel writer and photographer, and I've worked with Discover the World for several years, enjoying many trips with them in search of the amazing Aurora Borealis. Firstly, on behalf of Discover the World, can I just say a big thank you for your support during what's been a challenging uh, couple of years and for your continued support and enthusiasm for visiting the land of the Northern Lights. Tonight, we're gonna to be shining a light on one of Earth's greatest natural spectacles. We'll discover what causes the Northern Lights, what the best months are to witness them, how to boost your chances of a sighting and where to go to put yourself in the limelight. I've been lucky enough to see the Northern Lights in Iceland, Sweden, Finland, Norway and Svalbard, but I've always relied on expert help for each of the trips. Now with 38 years of Aurora hunting under their belt, Discover the World have unrivaled expertise and insider knowledge. They really do know all the best spots for seeing the Northern Lights. And they've used this as the basis for putting together an amazing collection of holidays from escorted trips to self drives and independent short breaks. Now, as well as showing you Europe's best Northern Lights locations, this webinar is helping you plan your holiday with confidence. Discover the World's working really closely with local partners to support the return of tourism with the utmost care and consideration. Travel regulations and quarantine rules are changing all the time. So I'm going to highlight some great Northern Lights holidays. Um, you can either book this coming season from October through to next March, or book ahead for the next Northern Lights season starting in autumn 2022. Now to um, answer your questions this evening, I am delighted uh, to welcome our panel of guests from the far north of Europe. Dan Björk is a former marketing and sales director of the Ice Hotel in Swedish Lapland and has offered Northern Lights holidays and winter experiences to guests from all over the world for 35 years in Sweden, Finland and Norway. And he's now the director of tourism for the spectacular Senja region in Northern Norway, which we'll be seeing later on. Saiva Bragason, um, is an award-winning astronomy educator and science communicator. He's the author of four best-selling books on astronomy, stargazing, and space science. And he also finds time to host TV and radio shows on science and environmental issues. He also runs Iceland's Aurora Forecast website, and he directs the country's only public observatory based at Hotel Ranga, which we'll also be popping into later on. An Australian Swede with a love of the outdoors, photography and living in the Arctic, Graham Richardson is the former head of marketing for the Swedish Lapland Visitors Board and is now a partner in several tourism enterprises in the region, including Arctic Retreat, stunning property in the Lulia region of northern Sweden, which we'll also see later. And finally, welcome to Bruno there, having spent his younger years exploring Iceland, Finland, and Northern Sweden. Bruno has been one of Discover the World's Nordic specialists for nearly a decade. And he has a particular love of Finnish Lapland, which he regards as one of the most beautiful places on earth, especially when the Northern Lights are in full flow. Please do send in your questions using the chat box. We'll try and get through as many as possible. And thank you very much if you've already sent in um, a question. We've had a great response. But don't worry if we don't get around to answering your question, we'll follow this webinar with an email answering all your questions and pointing you in the direction of where to find answers on the Discover the World website. Um, of course, you can also um, talk to one of Discover the World's travel specialists. And don't forget, you can now very simply arrange a virtual appointment by video call to discuss your holiday plans. Now, to give you an idea quickly of the format for this webinar, I'll be spending the next 30, 35 minutes or so delving into the magic of the Northern Lights, the best times to see them, where to go, and some great ideas for holidays. And we'll then go to 30 minutes of questions with our expert panel before wrapping things up at around 7.15. To start with, though, 
Let me just give you some background to Discover the World. As I mentioned to you, they've been organizing holidays to see the Northern Lights for 38 years. And their impressive portfolio of holidays is best on the, based on the best locations to go and see them. Now, in these unprecedented uh, days of uncertainty in the travel industry, Discover the World's flexibility promise offers that all important peace of mind when booking your holiday. Here it is in a nutshell. Um, you can cancel your holiday up to seven days prior to departure for Iceland and up to 45 days for other destinations and receive a full refund, including your deposit. You can change your travel dates or destination prior to departure, subject to availability, and you can also transfer your booking to another person suggested by you. If Discover the World has to cancel your holiday for whatever reason, they will give you a full refund and not a credit note. To help you in the planning stage, you'll find detailed Q&As on Discover the World's website for each of the, of the destinations as they open up for travel. But just to update you on the latest travel rules situation, all the places we're covering in the webinar tonight are open to vaccinated UK travellers, except Sweden, but their current restrictions are only valid until the end of October. And we're expecting Sweden to offer UK travellers uh, to uh, access, let them in from November onwards. But as I say, um, keep looking at the Q&A page on Discover the World's website for the very latest on all of that. About 10 years ago, during a family holiday to Swedish Lapland, we drove sled dogs out to this wonderful remote log cabin beside a frozen lake. And it was just after dinner that we walked outside and our heads spun upwards to find the aurora in full flow. These sinuous banners of green light arching overhead, pulsing from one horizon to the other, slowly changing to gently rippling curtains of lime and teal green. The display lasted for an hour, and it was my first full-blown Northern Lights moment, and I've been hooked ever since. Now, no one can guarantee that you're going to see the aurora, but one thing is certain, you're going to have an amazing time trying. This evening, you're going to find out how to boost your chances, but remember, witnessing the Northern Lights should always be viewed as a bonus, the celestial cherry on the top of a big slice of Arctic winter adventure. You might spend the day snowmobiling across frozen lakes or through Narnia-like forests where trees bow under the weight of snow. You might find yourself mushing your own team of huskies where the only sound is the fizz of snow beneath your sled runners and the rhythmic panting of the dogs. Perhaps you'll go whale watching on the trail of the incredible winter spectacle of orcas hunting shoals of herring along Iceland's west coast. Or maybe you'll ride a hovercraft across a frozen sea in Sweden's Gulf of Bosnia. Maybe you'll be seeking the ultimate wilderness escape, relaxing in a cozy log cabin deep in the snow forests of the far north, like the Arctic retreat here. The Northern Lights are always going to steal the show, but these are holidays with a big lineup of supporting acts. You'll be amazed at the range of activities and adventures that are available. More on them later, including this new one, Hot Air Ballooning in Lapland. Uh, but first, let's delve into the legends, the history and the science behind the Northern Lights. It's not only fascinating stuff, but it'll also make you a better Aurora hunter. Now, according to Finnish legend, when the fox runs across the Arctic fells, it lights up the night sky with sparks flying from its tail. And in fact, the Finnish word for the Northern Lights literally means fire fox. In many parts of Scandinavia, the Northern Lights were seen as a harbinger of good fortune. Fishermen looked up and saw vast shoals of herring shimmering overhead. Farmers saw psychedelic fields of swaying crops, while early Chinese legends associated the aurora with fire-breathing dragons. Inuit people used to live in fear of the lights, convinced they were evil spirits intent on a frenzy of beheading. And actually some Inuit stories quite bizarrely describe the aurora as human spirits 
playing football with the head of a dead walrus. Make of that what you will. At the very least, though, you should never wave or sing or whistle at the Northern Lights. Many cultures believe this would lure body snatching demons down from the sky. Now it was Galileo Galilei who witnessed the Northern Lights in 1621 and coined the phrase Aurora Borealis. Aurora for goddess of the dawn, Borealis for the Greek god of the north wind. But he thought it was caused by sunlight reflecting off the Earth's atmosphere. About a century later, the British astronomer Edmund Halley thought that the lights were caused by luminous material seeping from cracks in the Earth's crust. And it wasn't until 1908 that the Norwegian Christian Birkeland proposed the first accurate theory, which was only proven amazingly in 1967 when a US satellite recorded strange disturbances each time it passed over the poles. This stunning video uh, from NASA shows the Aurora Borealis viewed from the International Space Station. So what exactly is happening up there? What causes the Northern Lights? Well, it all starts in the sun's core where immense pressure and temperatures of 27 million degrees Fahrenheit fuel the process of nuclear fusion. The energy generated by this creates large bubbles of hot plasma, a soup of intensely charged particles. And these swell and circulate so full of unrestrained energy that every now and then they erupt from the Earth's surface, a coronal mass ejection. Flung out at speeds of a thousand kilometers per second, this supercharged plasma hurtles through space. Now, luckily for us, we have our trusty magnetic field. So if Earth lies in the path of this deadly solar wind, which usually takes around two to four days to reach us, most of the plasma is deflected into space. But enough of the supercharged electrons and protons sneak into our upper atmosphere, particularly at the poles where magnetic fields are weaker, and start colliding with oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. Following a collision, these elements store some of the energy or become excited, and the only way they can become more stable again is by releasing photons, or in other words, producing light. Now just imagine this atomic process happening to billions of atoms stretching hundreds of kilometers into the atmosphere. That's what creates the gentle moving light of the Aurora Borealis. Sometimes it's delicate and subtle, strands of phosphorescent green flirting with the stars, other times you might see the aurora turned up to max, almost like a glowing vortex swirling overhead. The different colors depend on two main factors, what type of element is reacting with the solar particles and what altitude the activity is taking place. Now, if you're watching a green aurora, that's light or photons being given off by oxygen around 100 to 150 kilometers up, it becomes red light if the action is taking place higher, up to around 200 to 250 kilometers. If you see blue, pink, or violet colors, that's from nitrogen molecules. I photographed this aurora in Svalbard during the polar night, 24 hours darkness and minus 35. A pinky crimson color is from hydrogen, usually lower in the atmosphere. So you sometimes see this at the bottom of a green band. What about the different shapes? The aurora is essentially uh, plasma, an electrically charged gas. So it's constantly changing, unpredictable, erratic. Now there's all kinds of fiendish physics to explain the different shapes and the various forms, but a lot depends on where the activity is happening relative to where you're standing. So an aurora like this, for example, might look like giant swaying curtains from this position. But if you were to look up at the same aurora from directly below, it might take on the appearance of a corona, rays of light converging to a point. Same aurora, different perspective. Of course, you don't need to know or even care about all the science. If for you, the aurora is simply pure magic, that's fantastic. 
that's great. But if you're a serious aurora hunter, it really does help to understand what's fueling this phenomenon. Did you know, for example, that roughly every 11 years, the sun's magnetic poles flip? On Earth, that would be like the North and South Pole changing position, absolute mayhem. The so-called solar cycle changes the sun's mood dramatically, like a fire being stoked. When it's quiet, the sun is at solar minimum. But when it's particularly active during solar maximum, it's blazing with flares, solar eruptions, and those coronal mass ejections I mentioned earlier. Now we're entering the latest phase of a solar maximum. It's called solar cycle 25, and it means the sun will be ramping up activity over the next few years and flinging out much more of that supercharged plasma into space, generating more geomagnetic storms on Earth and that means it's prime time for Northern Lights watching. The aurora can be visible on a clear night, any time between September and March, sometimes as early as August and as late as mid-April. The equinox months of September and March often have some of the best activity, while the midwinter months from December to February have the longest hours of darkness. It's worth looking basically as soon as it gets dark if you have clear skies above. So woolly hats and gloves on, let's head to Europe's far north to discover the best places to see the Aurora Borealis. We're heading to a region under the so-called Auroral Oval, a donut shaped ring around the earth with the Northern Lights on the most frequent and most spectacular. Now when scientists discovered that the sun was not only responsible for creating the Northern Lights, but also for sending us potentially harmful particles, they needed to establish a way of measuring the power of aurora producing geomagnetic storms. And they came up with this, the KP index. Now the most common activity is usually KP1 to KP3. So looking at this map, you can see immediately just how important it is to focus your Northern Lights watching on Swedish and Finnish Lapland, Northern Norway and Iceland, and also Svalbard, parts of Greenland, Canada and Alaska. And that's why Discover the World specializes in these areas for Northern Lights holidays. It's just where you'll stand the best chances of seeing them. Now the KP index also helps us to forecast the Northern Lights. And so I checked the Space Weather Live website the latest forecast and found this. Yesterday morning, um, this happened on the sun's surface. Look at the left-hand video and you can see a solar flare eruption. Then if you look at the black and white video, which is a playing on a loop, it's just happened once there, there's the coronal mass ejection that happened yesterday morning following the solar flare eruption, hurling those particles into space. And this one's heading towards us right now. So looking at the KP index for the next couple of days, there you can see the red bars, the point at which the solar wind is going to reach Earth around midnight tomorrow, generating KP5 promising conditions for Northern Lights watching. Now let's take a closer look at Sweden. Travel to the Arctic Circle, deep in Swedish Lapland, and you'll experience proper winters where snow covers from October to May, and it gets cold enough to actually freeze the sea in the Gulf of Bothnia. And from early December to January, the sun doesn't rise and you can experience the magical blue twilight of the polar night. Our favorite places for Northern Lights watching in Sweden include Abisko National Park, uh, the Ice Hotel and Lulia. When it comes to Northern Lights potential, Abisko National Park has everything going for it. Not only is it right in the middle of the Auroral Oval, but it also lies in a rain shadow. And where there's less rain, there are obviously fewer clouds. Remember, the Aurora could be blazing away, but if it's thick cloud, you won't see it. Abisko has more nights of clear skies than anywhere in Europe. And being a national park means there's very little artificial light pollution. The Aurora Sky Station, shown here, puts you in the perfect spot 
This time lapse was taken by Peter Rosen, superb Northern Lights photographer, and it shows the Aurora only slightly speeded up. The last time I was here, I spent an hour or two uh, lying on my back in the snow on the top of this mountain, um, stargazing as I waited for the Northern Lights to appear. Wrapped up warm in polar suits and boots, all provided before you take the chairlift up the mountain. Um, we actually thought it was going to be a no-show. Uh, then this happened. The aurora erupted from behind the mountain, almost like green ink being poured into the night sky. And it was so strong that even the full moon that you can see here had little effect on its brightness. The lights then drifted above us in these huge pulsating waves until they filled half the sky. Great location, no light pollution. Abisko demonstrates perfectly why it's so consistently good for Northern Lights watching. Now, about an hour's drive from Abisko, the Ice Hotel is another Aurora hotspot, forged during, sorry, forged using thousands of tons of, of ice from the frozen River Tone. The seasonal ice hotel is reborn each winter in the village of Yukasyavi. Sculptors transform its interior into these amazing ice artworks and fabulous suites before the whole creation melts back into the river during spring. Here's a little video just to show you the ice hotel's wonderful location beside the river, 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, beside the frozen river, where these giant blocks of ice are harvested each winter. And then begins the magic with ice sculptors from all around the world creating these spellbinding suites. Um, and also, of course, the famous ice bar where you can drink cocktails in the rocks. I could easily spend this whole presentation looking at the ingenious designs of the Ice Hotel's art suites, but I just picked one of the most recent ones here, uh, the Living Ocean, to give you an idea of the creativity that goes into them. The bed you can see there has a base of solid ice. Over that goes a, a thick mattress and reindeer furs, and then you're given a polar sleeping bag. And because it's so uh, peaceful and tranquil inside the light, then inside the ice hotel, uh, you really do get an amazing night's sleep. Discover the World is the ice hotel's leading worldwide partner. And their signature ice hotel break includes one night sleeping on ice and another two in warm accommodation, staying in stylish cabins on the ice hotel site. A huge range of activities can be pre-booked on this holiday, everything from ice sculpting classes and sauna rituals to husky sledding and snowmobile safaris. Abisko National Park and the Ice Hotel are perfect partners. Uh, you can combine in this three or four night break, which includes a night of northern light spotting at the Aurora Sky Station here. Heading southeast now across Swedish Lapland, we reach the Gulf of Bosnia, a frozen sea during winter where you can stay in cabins or lodges on ice locked islands. From the gateway city of Lulia, which you can fly direct now with uh, new flights from Heathrow starting this December, you can also venture inland for a Northern Lights escape at fabulous properties like the Arctic Retreat, the Arctic Bath and the Tree Hotel. But first let's visit Brandon Lodge shown here tucked into the forested shoreline of the frozen sea. What an amazing place this is. Um, it's renowned for its clear skies, huge horizons, and lack of light pollution. And thanks to Graham on our panel for this incredible photo of the lodge, the main building here, with the aurora in full flow. This is the main building. Walk inside and you'll find a very smart lounge with open fire and a cosy snug and bar to one side. This four night break at Brandon Lodge includes a snowmobiling safari, dog sled adventure and Northern Lights tour. But there are plenty of other optional activities too from ice fishing, hovercraft tours across the frozen pack ice, which is a really amazing experience, um, Nordic winter skills and snowshoe walks. Brandon Lodge also makes a great twin stay with the Tree Hotel which many of you may have heard about, home to seven head-spinning grown-up tree houses, like the mirror cube here, perfectly camouflaged in the forest by its reflective glass walls. 
There's also the two bedroom seventh room, which has a lounge with these huge windows for brilliant aurora gazing and the flying saucer here, which appears to hover in this forest clearing. Activities at the Tree Hotel range from husky sledding to a soak in a wood-fired outdoor bathtub in the forest spa. And close by, down on the river, you can really indulge yourself at the Arctic Bath Hotel, which only opened in 2020 and was the brainchild of the, the clever people behind the Tree Hotel. The main building, which you can see in this picture, actually floats on the river. It's circular log jam design, concealing saunas, treatment rooms, and a central plunge pool. Amazing place. Like the Tree Hotel and Arctic Bath, the Arctic Retreat is only an hour's transfer from Lulia, and it's hidden away in the wilderness, and combines traditional log cabin appeal with contemporary touches like these amazing floor to ceiling windows for optimum Northern Lights viewing. Also offers fine dining, jacuzzis, wood-fired saunas. Graham on our expert panel will tell you lots more about it, I'm sure, but here's just a little glimpse inside one of the cabins. In Sweden, Arctic glamping is also an option. This is Aurora Safari Camp where you can snuggle into tents um, based on the ones traditionally used by the Sami people. The camp operates hot air balloon flights over the Arctic wilderness, either tethered to the ground for optimal northern lights viewing or free floating from morning drifting above the snow forests and frozen lakes in search of moose and reindeer far below you. Okay, let's look at Finland next. Perfect if you're dreaming of a, of a log cabin maybe with a crackling log fire, um, open fire tucked away in the forest. Finnish Lapland, I think, is really um, an authentic Arctic experience where you can explore pristine wilderness by snowshoes, snowmobile, husky sled, completely untainted by light pollution. The Aurora Borealis really does shine brightly here, like Swedish Lapland. And all you need to do is just step outside your cabin and look up. There are plenty of exciting destinations to choose from. Discover the world have picked the best log cabin and lodge retreats, many with private saunas. Several of the holiday options include a range of fully inclusive activities, which makes them especially good value. This is Nellen Wilderness Hotel, 350 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, snuggled into trees above Lake Anari. You've heard this before this evening, and you'll, you'll hear it mentioned plenty of times later on, I'm sure. Um, but Nellin is far away from any artificial light pollution for those all important dark night skies for excellent northern lights potential. It even has its own Aurora camp out on the frozen lake. You'll take a trip there as part of a package of activities, including this three or seven night all inclusive holiday, husky sledding snowshoeing, snowmobiling are all included and you can choose to stay in a log cabin with a private sauna or upgrade to an aurora bubble for aurora gazing from the comfort of your bed. Finland's heaviest snowfall blankets Sayoti National Park in over two meters of the white stuff every year. The fir trees literally bow under the weight of it and the forest has this almost um, surreal stillness and silence about it. The wilderness resort of ISO COT is in a prime spot to soak up the atmosphere and enjoy the Northern Lights. And if you book here before the end of November, you can get four nights for the price of three. Straddling the Arctic Circle, Ravinyemi is best known as the home of Santa Claus, of course, of course. Um, but where the city ends and the Lapland wilderness begins, you'll find the Apuka Resort, where accommodation ranges from suites and log cabins to these glass-roofed Aurora cabins. At nearby Ranwa, you can stay in a glass igloo or a family villa and spot local species like this lynx at the Ranwa Wildlife Park. And a great choice for winter, uh, for Christmas or a New Year break, the Star Arctic Hotel has panoramic views across the Saraselka Fells. All-inclusive breaks include a choice of daily activities, such as snowmobiling, husky sledding, and wilderness dining or a private sauna. 
Each of the Northern Lights destinations we're looking at this evening has its own uh, special appeal, and Norway is no different. And I think while Sweden and Finland immerse you in the fells and the forests and the frozen lakes of Lapland, Norway offers the magic of the Arctic coast in winter. Imagine whale watching in the fjords around the Arctic city of Tromsø, or keeping a lookout for the Northern Lights from the deck of a her local Hertogruten ferry as it noses through the fjords. Discover the World's Norwegian winter holiday program also features the spectacular islands of Senja and Lofoten and the far-flung Svalbard archipelago, halfway between the, the mainland and the North Pole. Here's Tromso, lying around 350 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, and it offers a fascinating contrast to the wilderness areas of the far north. Based in a harbourside hotel, um, you could join a well watching trip or an aurora hunting tour and then peruse the city's cafes and galleries. Other highlights of the Paris of the North include a dramatic cathedral and a polar museum where you can follow in the footsteps of explorers like Amundsen. For the best of both worlds, city culture and Northern Lights potential you could combine Tromso with the fjordside Malangan Resort, just 90 minutes to the south, where you can enjoy amazing views from one of its cabins perched on stilts right at the water's edge. A short walk leads to the resort's hilltop Aurora Lookout, where local guides shed light on the mysteries of the Northern Lights while you scan the heavens. Also close to Tromso, the new Ice Domes Hotel has a cinema, a restaurant and bar, as well as seven ice suites, including this festive themed one. And new from Discover the World this winter, a week long sailing adventure on this fantastic uh, tall ship takes you from Tromso through the remote fjords of Northern Way. And what a wonderful opportunity to not only look out for northern lights from the deck of a ship, but also to witness pods of feeding orcas and humpback whales feeding on the herring that often gather in the fjords up there. Now in a region renowned for its dramatic landscapes, the island of Senja to the southwest of Tromso really stands out. And this image taken in March shows Senja's sawtooth mountains and deep fjords crowned by a dazzling display of the Northern Lights. It really is an incredibly magical place. After a night in Tromso, you travel by ferry to a small fishing village on the island's north coast, where your all-inclusive adventure includes dog sledding, an Arctic boat safari, and two Northern Lights excursions. <clears throat> Another great location along the Norwegian coast, the Lofoten Islands are ideal for a winter self-drive touring through the breathtaking archipelago, exploring its Viking heritage, doing some whale watching, and of course, keeping a lookout for the aurora. Norway's scenery reaches a crescendo of snowy peaks and ice-locked fjords in Svalbard, in Spitsbergen, where midwinter heralds the polar night, a mesmerizing 24-hour twilight, where you can witness the northern lights flickering over mountains like these. This is a picture I took just behind Longyearbyen, the world's northernmost town. Fly here from Tromso and you're halfway to the North Pole. And Longyearbyen is not only a fascinating place in its own right, offering a rich history of, of um, exploration and a unique insight into what life is really like in the high Arctic, but it's also the hub for adventures ranging from everything from uh, husky sledding to glacier tours and ice cave tours, snowmobile safaris, and so on. From the land of the polar night to the land of fire and ice, the final destination I'd like to take you to this evening is Iceland, another superb destination for Northern Lights watching. Discover the world's small group escorted tours take you in search of everything from the Aurora Borealis to orcas, to waterfalls, to ice caves. They can even arrange for you to witness the ongoing volcanic eruption near Reykjavik. Who knows, you might be lucky enough to witness the Northern Lights dancing above the lava fountain. If you do, please take a picture and send it in to us. If you want to travel independently, 
a winter self-drive is easier than you might think, especially on the south and west coasts where the Gulf Stream helps to keep the climate mild. Drive 90 minutes or so north or south from Reykjavik and you'll find yourself in the heart of rural Iceland, where once again, the night skies are big, dark and free from light pollution. Two of our favorite hotels, Ranga and Husafell are located here. Both offer an Aurora wake-up service, so you can go to bed confident that you won't miss the northern lights should they make an appearance. Slip into one of Ranga's outdoor hot tubs and you can lie back and soak up the cosmic light show dancing above you. Hotel Ranga also has its own state-of-the-art observatory, and I'm sure Saiva on our panel tonight will tell you more about that later. At both properties, you can fill your days and nights with activities such as four-wheel drive super jeep safaris, snowmobiling on the glaciers, the ice caps, uh, glacier tours, scenic flights. Great food is also um, a feature of both hotels, but they also have their unique identities. Stylish log cabin hotel Ranga, with its intimate, friendly atmosphere, and the sleek, more contemporary hotel Husafell, perfect bolt hole from which to explore the natural wonders of West Iceland, from the Lanyokel ice cap to the Snæfells Nest Peninsula. Dominated by a snow-capped volcano, which you just see in the background there, the Snæfells Nest Peninsula in West Iceland is a magnificent place, notched with bays and fjords, which, is a, which are a magnet to big shoals of overwintering herring, which attract hungry orcas, um, Discover the World's Orcas and Aurora Holiday actually combines expert-led whale watching tours to witness this spectacle of orcas feeding there with opportunities for seeing Northern Lights displays like this. As the world's leading Iceland specialist, Discover the World not only have a wide range of holidays to choose from, but they can also tailor make your holiday to suit your time frame, your budget and interests. Uh, the Northern Lights special here is their signature small group escorted holiday in winter, which includes Hotel Ranga, the natural wonders of the Golden Circle, a visit to Reykjavik and a dip in the Blue Lagoon. While Northern Lights glaciers and waterfalls takes you on a self-drive odyssey to Hotel Husafell and Iceland's Wild West. Well, I hope that's given you plenty of inspiration and ideas for your next Northern Lights adventure. Wherever and whenever you choose to travel, uh, the specialists at Discover the World are ready to help you plan your holiday, whether it's an aurora hunting self-drive on the south coast of Iceland, husky sledding through the forests of Finland, or a night at one of the Ice Hotel's art suites. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen and Delighted to welcome back our panel of experts, Dan, Saiva, Graham, and Bruno, who are ready to answer your questions. And I would just like to say a special thank you to Dan, who broke his nose yesterday, but has still very nobly and gallantly offered to take part this evening. But um, don't worry, Dan, I'll give all the difficult questions to the others. Um, <laughs> many thanks to all of you that have sent in your questions. Uh, in advance. We've had lots of viewers asking about what is the best country or best region for seeing the Northern Lights. So I think we should start by asking each of our panelists where their most memorable sighting was of the Aurora and the one place that really stood out for them and where they're aiming to try next. So Dan, can I come to you first for that? Absolutely. Thank you so much for a very good presentation. Uh, it's hard to pick one particular place, but uh, if I uh, try to connect my brain with my heart, uh, I have a memory of uh, going out from the ice hotel uh, with a dog sledge team uh, in January, really cold, probably minus 40 below. Uh, dogs are all, they're all howling when you start, but as soon as they start uh, running, they're dead quiet. So you go out through the forest, it's very quiet, and uh, then you just stop and see this amazing aurora. That, that's a strong, strong memory. 
another memory I had was just the other night, uh, last week, when we here at Senja went out by boat on a dead calm ocean, which doesn't happen every day. And uh, we went out to uh, a small island in the archipelago on the west coast of uh, Samia. And we stopped on a coral beach and uh, just sat there and looked at the aurora. But uh, for us living up here, it's uh, aurora never, it's always amazing. You, sometimes when you, even when you commute between where you live and where you work, you have to stop because it's so amazing. It's, uh, it's always something that, uh, that will inf inflict on you. It, it's strong. That's brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Um, Saifa, how about you? Uh, my most memorable aurora, um, it was probably in October, November of 2003. Uh, the sun had been hurtling towards us, these giant clouds of plasma. And Iceland was pretty cloudy at that time. I remember it was raining that particular day. But shortly after midnight, the skies went completely clear, at least from where I lived. And I was greeted by this uh, extremely red color in the sky. And that's one of the most powerful auroric displays I've ever seen personally, and also the most memorable, not because they were dancing all around, but because they were quiet and serene. And I was probably one of the of very few people who actually enjoyed them at the, at the moment. These particular lights were quite famous because they were uh, actually seen all the way down to Florida and even further south. And they are actually, uh, they are called the Halloween lights of 2003 because of that, but they were absolutely mind blowing and amazing. Wow, that sounds amazing. Thanks, Saiba. Um, Graham, how about you? <clears throat> Graham, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, it's hard to pick a, um, a particular Northern Lights experience that's one above the other. We, we're fortunate up here, we get to see so many and um, ranging from the small and, and tricky to the you know, large and beautiful. So they're, they're very different. Um, I guess for me, uh, per personally, it comes down to, I had family over from Australia, uh, two different groups of my family. And we, we, we were lucky enough over four nights, we saw Northern Lights each night in Lulio, um, up near uh, Yellowbuddy and Yokmok. And then on the last night, we were driving towards Abisko that you mentioned earlier. And as we're driving into Abisko, the usual hole in the sky was over Abisko. And it just, uh, between there and Bjork and the place just lit up with um, the lights. And so having family from Australia here, that was a pretty special night, I would think. So wow. for me. And, um, you know, we do a, a lot of Northern Lights guiding. I've done quite a bit with my photography um, business as well. And, you know, there is many, many nights where, and probably the most beautiful thing you see is when you have clients that have, perhaps tried once or twice to see the Northern Lights or perhaps it's their first time and they actually get to see it on the first night of their holiday on this particular occasion. And, you know, you have, you can have clients that are, that are in tears, um, which sort of brings us to tears at the same time, because, you know, there's just such a magical feeling to see them finally after that dreams fulfilled. So that's also pretty special, I think. Thanks, Graham. That sounds amazing. Bruno, come to you. How about you? Um, mine's probably one of the first ones I ever saw. Um, it was in northern Finland at Nelim, uh, one of the properties you touched on earlier, uh, out on the frozen lake. We'd had a horrendous day of weather. It was snow, blizzards coming in sidewards. Um, about nine o'clock, the clouds just parted and we had the most amazing northern lights. It started off uh, like the curtains, like the photo you had earlier, and it ended looking like the corona. Um, it was it was an incredible display. It's one that I'll never forget. Wow, that's amazing! It, it, it's just incredible, isn't it? How how varied the the displays can be, and how addictive they can be, because you just never know what you're going to see and when it's going to happen. I think that's part of the the thrill of going aurora hunting. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, Dan, let's talk a little bit more about um, your region that you're that you're um, looking after at the moment, Senja Island off the coast of northern Norway. Um, and we saw from those photographs earlier that it has this incredible combination of um, amazing mountain scenery, the coast, plus you have the northern lights and it's just amazing. But can you tell us a bit more about what you can do there during autumn and winter? 
Uh, yes, it's uh, it's the second largest island in uh, Norway. It's uh, the Norwegians call it Norway in a miniature, and the reason for that is that uh, you have so many microclimates. You have this wall of mountains just yes, rising up from the ocean on the west side, and then you have uh, some other climates uh, on the east side that towards the mainland in shadow of the islands. Uh, sorry, in shadow of the mountains, a little bit like uh, the, the factor that Obisco is also uh, enjoying with low precipitation. Uh, and it's uh, one national park and 27 uh, national reserves just in the island. So it, it gives you an idea of how well protected it is for its natural beauty. Uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, best way to see the aurora in uh, in Senia is uh, you're always on the coast but it's try to look into the possibilities to get out on the ocean uh, in a rib boat or uh, even in kayak in the winter is fine if the weather is okay or by uh, a little bit more comfortable escorted uh, 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 boats where you can actually be warm and even have a meal on board and uh, dog sledging is here yes you can go snowshoeing you have the traditional winter activities uh, the thing you don't have is snowmobiling and uh, we're quite happy about that <laughs> it's a quiet island and uh, we're only a very few small villages very local uh, venues for the hotels uh, very little artificial light but it's all about the ocean if you come to Sanya. It's Northern Light and the ocean in some sort of combination. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. This, Senya is definitely on my bucket list. I mean, the, the idea of sea kayaking under the Aurora Borealis, two of my favorite things. That, that's, that's definitely going on my wish list. Thank you so much. Um, Saiva, can I, can I come to you next? Um, you run these amazing stargazing and Aurora viewing evenings at the observatory at Hotel Rangau in uh, Southwest Iceland. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the observatory and how why it's so special, but also what else you're hoping to see in the night sky there? Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, the observatory, like you said in your talk, is the only public observatory that we have in Iceland, because Iceland is not really very suitable for any professional uh, observatories for numerous, numerous reasons. But this is a small house that has this uh, roll of roof. So I just push a button and the roof rolls off revealing the whole night sky above us. So the walls shelter us from the wind, which makes it a little bit more comfy than just standing outside and being bombarded with the wind, which is quite often um, quite fast here, as you probably know. So inside we have two telescopes, a couple of, a couple of them that are also computerized. Uh, one is a refractor, a lens telescope, and the other one is a reflector. So we kind of have best of both worlds. We can magnify everything what uh, everything we want to magnify quite a lot, but we also have a nice wide field of view with the refractor. Um, what we are hoping to see when we look at them is, of course, planets, if there are any planets visible in the night sky at any given time. For example, now, uh, for the next few couple of months or so, we will be greeted by Jupiter and Saturn in the, in the evening sky, which is, of course, beautiful to look at. But also, we are trying to look at nebulae and clusters and, and, uh, and galaxies, faraway galaxies. And everything is done, uh, the reason we built this observatory is that uh, sometimes we have to wait for the northern lights to make an appearance. And while you wait for them, why not just take a moment and, and look up at all the other beautiful phenomena that's up there. Brilliant, thank you. And, and the Milky Way, do you see that much? Yes, of course, the Milky Way. This is actually the best time of the year for us to see the Milky Way because we miss out on the summer Milky Way. So we get the kind of the, uh, the remnants or the remains of the summer Milky Way. So this is the best time of the year, but otherwise in, in like March, we are looking away from it, which makes it a little bit harder to spot, but it's there, of course. Brilliant. Thanks, Saiva. Um, Graham, can I come to you next? We had a sneak peek of the Arctic retreat in Sweden's uh, Lulia region uh, earlier. Can you describe, um, I think you're actually sitting in one of the cabins there. Can you just tell us a bit more about what makes it such a special place? Yeah, happy to do that. Um, Arctic retreats are one of the properties that I'm involved in as a, an owner and, and manager. And we have a, here a very special little place. There are three, only three log timber cabins and they're all fitted to a very high standard, um, which makes it very private. So we're a very small 
um, uh, facility. Uh, we're located on the edge of a river, the Rawney River in Swedish Upland, uh, which flows past us and we're surrounded by the river and, and lots of lakes. And uh, we're right in the middle of the forest in, in the middle of, of northern Sweden, we're about an hour north of Luleå. So we're close to transport to the airport, um, but for way out in the forest at the same time. We're very small scale, we're very personal. We like to take very good care of the six to eight guests maximum that we have here at any given time. And uh, we have private activities for our guests and uh, we're a very dark area. So um, as many of the other places we've mentioned and other places that are on the panel, um, we have, we're away from the big city, we're away from you know big towns. So we have very little light pollution. And uh, most times you can see the Northern Lights if they're out from the deck of your cabin or perhaps from the, the hot tub um, sitting out the front of your, your cabin. Sounds idyllic. Another one for my wish list. Thanks a lot, Graham. Um, Bruno, welcome. can I come to you now? Um, we've had lots of questions asking about the best time to see the Northern Lights, which hopefully um, we've largely covered in the talk. Uh, but some viewers want to know when is the best time for the Northern Lights and the best snow conditions? Can you help us with that? Yeah, of course, it's, it's a good question. Um, as you mentioned in the presentation, Northern Lights is mid-August through to around mid-April. Uh, um, the snow doesn't usually arrive until mid-December um, in Finland, Sweden and Norway. In Iceland, snow can be very hit and miss. Um, it's not always guaranteed they may have went without snow. Um, therefore, if you're looking for a snow-based trip, it's Norway, Sweden or Finland from mid-December through to the end of March into early April is the best time to look at. Brilliant. Thanks, Bruno. Um, Saiva, can I come back to, to you? Apart from the equinoxes, um, which we mentioned are, the, are two of the best months for Northern Lights watching, um, viewers are asking, um, what are the other specific times which might boost your chances of, of seeing the Northern Lights? <clears throat> So yeah, that's a very good question. But when we look at the number of, of sightings, I mean, the number of, of times when is the best time on average, you get an idea that it's close to the equinoxes. So September, October, and March, April are on average the best months. Uh, of course, you can see the Northern Lights throughout the dark months. So even if you arrive here in December and January, you are very likely to see Northern Lights, even though you're not in, on prime time. Also during, uh, throughout the day, on average, the hours of between maybe 11 o'clock and one o'clock are often the best bet. So if you are outside chasing the Northern Lights, just be patient and try to stay outside for as long as you possibly can without freezing to death, of course, just dress warmly. And the key is to be patient. Just be here when, when, the, uh, when it's dark enough and try to be as close to midnight as possible. That's good advice. Thanks, Saiba. Um, the most common question, uh, Dan, if I come back to you, that we're being asked is, um, what is the best place, best country, region to go to to maximise your chance of seeing the aurora? Everybody wants to know what the secret is. Um, there's so much choice, isn't there, and so much variety. But as someone with experience of, of two very contrasting places, the Ice Hotel and Senja Island, um, what advice would you give someone who's still trying to make up their minds about where to go out of, out of all the places we've talked about? Uh, my clear advice would be to <laughs> focus on what you mentioned in your presentation, Will, is uh, the other things. Because uh, as we all know, you might see the aurora, but you may not. Uh, the reason for your travel is to see the aurora, and uh, definitely uh, that's the focus. But uh, Focus on uh, the activities, make sure you stay in a place that you like. Uh, the activities are important. And uh, for, for Senja in, uh, in the winter months, it's the high season of, of good food because uh, we're a fishing destination and that's the, that's the high, high season for, uh, for the scray, the cod fishing. So food, have a good time, activities, uh, Pay some attention to that as well. And uh, I can't say what the best place is uh, for an experience. Uh, uh, the Sunny Island will have a coastal climate. It will never be the winter like uh, Finland or uh, Luleå or Obisko. 
but it will be the possibility of actually looking out towards the horizon of, uh, of the Norwegian Sea, the Arctic Ocean, and see the aurora over there. So uh, be careful when you, when you choose. I, I can't see that anyone is better than the other, but uh, make sure you put some energy and, and focus into the alternatives if, if the clouds are there. Mm, Thank yeah. you. That's good advice. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Graham, any, anything to add to that? Top tips on how to choose where to go? Graham, I think you're on mute again. I think that um, I, I agree with Dan. I think that uh, wherever you go, you're going to have a great time and need to focus on the activities and all the fun things to do up here, whether it be on Iceland or Norway, Finland, or, or even in Sweden. And wherever you go, there are good chances to see the Northern Lights. It'd be difficult to name to name one over the other. And um, so I, I think that as Dan suggested, you know, quite well, um, look at what you want to see in terms of or do in terms of accommodation and what interests you and what activities you like. You know, the beautiful coastline of Norway, that's hard to go past it, as, as is the, you know, the beautiful forests of, you know, right across Finland. So, but, uh, you know, look for the other items and activities to do and we'll keep our fingers crossed that you see the lights wherever you go. Yeah, I think I guess the key message is one trip is never going to be enough. No, Not that I'm blatantly plugging Discover the World holidays or anything, but you know you could spend the rest of your life <laughs> covering these Discover these um, Northern Lights destinations. Um, Graham, while we're chatting, um, question about the most luxurious way to try and experience the Northern Lights. Someone has mm -hmm. asked. Um, now we touched them on, on the talk, didn't we? But there's quite a range of pretty special places to stay in Sweden, aren't there? Yeah, there's a lot of special places here. Um, everything from if we talk luxurious, you know, we don't have um, a lot of we don't have hotels or or lodges that are luxury in the in the in the sense of the word that you know you're not staying at the um, you know the Grand Hotel in Stockholm or similar when you're coming to the north of Sweden, Finland. But they are some very lovely hotels that are extremely um, well presented and very very nice and very comfortable. Arctic Bath is a brand new design hotel. Tree Hotel is quite famous. Um, the Ice Hotel, of course, you've mentioned earlier, is a spectacular place. There's some beautiful destination hotels and lodges in Finland that I'm, you know, familiar with. Um, you know, there's a lot of beautiful places to go. So where the accommodation is, is uh, is very very high standard, even if we don't use the word luxury as such. Mm. But I think for me, what, what, what I see with a lot of our guests that are looking for that type of luxury type experience, what they're really looking for is, is an element of privacy and small scale and low numbers of people. So luxury means to me and a lot of our guests is to being just them and their family. It might be a couple sitting out on the deck of their cabin here with nobody else around in the middle of the forest and then you know, the Northern Lights sort of coming up around them, that's luxury. You know, you can't, you can't beat that. Um, or it might be a family group who are spending quality time together and there's just them here at this at the Arctic Retreat where I am now. And again, I think that small scale um, privacy is um, um, and spending time with friends is what makes the whole experience luxury. So mm -hmm. in, a, in, in probably even more importantly than the, the physical standard of the accommodation you're staying at. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, Graham. It's th those sort of experiences are, are priceless, aren't they? Um, thank you for that. Bruno, what about some um, special places to stay in Iceland? Um, yeah, I think sort of echoing a lot that Graham said, um, there's a lot, Iceland is special pretty much everywhere. Um, the Hotel Ranger is one of my personal favorite places. Um, it's just the service there is excellent. I've got a hundred percent record of seeing the Aurora being there, um, which is obviously helps. Um, but as you said, Hotel Husafell is another um, incredible place. There are more properties sort of appearing, which you would class as luxury. We have the retreat at the Blue Lagoon, which is a real five-star property. Um, very special stay there. You have Deplast Farm up in the north. Um, again, that is it's a stunning location in the mountains, no one around, um, it's just beautiful. The Hotel Siglo, also up in the north, um, people who have seen Trapped would recognize it, um, but that's a beautiful area. 
but as Graham said, luxury could mean a lot of things. For example, we have a self-catering cottage on Snaples Nest Peninsula, um, and you could step outside the back door. You have the volcano with the snow covered, snow covering it in front of you, with Northern Lights dancing above. And for me, that that's my idea of luxury. Um, so it all varies, but yes, there are some very special properties in Iceland. That's brilliant. Thanks, Bruno. Interesting you mentioned North Iceland there, because um, Saiva, I wanted to come to you next, because we talked about South and West Iceland in the talk a little bit earlier. Um, but Discover the World also offer winter self-drives in North Iceland. Um, so what would you say are the main highlights of, of heading up into North Iceland? Um, yeah, before I answer that, uh, I can actually I'll tell you that I've, I've managed to see the Northern Lights dancing above the volcano. Uh, it's actually quite difficult. You need, really need to be here in the right spot at the right time to see it. But it's, it's absolutely a gorgeous sight. Currently, it's dormant, or at least it's quiet, so there's nothing really happening. But it's definitely worth trying if you get here. But mm -hmm. to your question, well, the main highlights of heading north in the winter, there are so many. I mean, you mentioned or Bruno actually mentioned a few of the places that are in the north, like Siglufjörður, uh, where Trapped takes place, but also Akureyri, the biggest uh, place you can actually visit there. It's a nice place to stay, to have a base, and you can drive to pretty much all the interesting locations that are quite close by. Um, other place to mention is Husavik, where if you have seen the Eurovision Song, Cost, Song Contest movie, it takes place there. And from there, there's an easy drive to Lake Mivat, which for me is the most gorgeous place in the northern part of the country. It's a little bit within the country, uh, and it's a lake surrounded by volcanoes and geothermal areas. So you can bathe in one of the thermal pools there, easily have something really good to eat, and step outside into the freezing cold and look up, which also happens to be one of the clearest places in the north, this particular area. So Lake Mivat. If you go there, you're in for a real treat. It's beautiful. Brilliant. Thanks, Saiva. Um, what about the logistics, though, Bruno, of a, of a winter self-drive in North Iceland? So we talked about the, the south and the west having the effect of the Gulf Stream, but obviously I, I guess it's a, the winters are harder and colder up in the north. Does that make a difference to driving up there? Um, it does not it doesn't. Um, I'd say there are certain areas in the north that you wouldn't, uh, try in the winter for example the northwest fjords um, we don't, don't recommend those in the winter these fjords can be trickier as well um, in the winter but the actual northern area is definitely drivable um, in terms of vehicles we'd never offer anything that's less than a four-wheel drive and the winter studded tires will automatically be included with the car the other good thing we do is we always monitor the weather um, so if it's going to be particular high winds or a particular bad storm on the day you're meant to be traveling we will contact you, even organise you to stay where you are for another night before moving on. Um, at the end of the day, safety is paramount and we will always ensure that your safety comes first. But if you're lucky, you could have beautiful blue skies with this lovely winter landscape and driving is very easy in Iceland. Brilliant. Thanks, Bruno. It's probably a good time to, to add to that. But um, when you book a, a self-drive holiday with Discover the World, you are able to download their exclusive iDiscover app onto your phone or tablet. And um, that gives you a whole amazing range of features, everything from your own bespoke itinerary to a whole database of places to see and eat out restaurants, but also the nearest petrol station, links to the Aurora forecast, weather forecasts, and obviously a messaging system to keep you in touch with, with um, people that discover the world in case, as Bruno says, the weather is, is not looking good or something. So that's a really useful extra um, peace of mind, I guess, when you're, when you're traveling on a self-drive in, in winter. Um, Dan, if I can come back to you, I'm one of my favorite places in the, in the far north, um, Svalbard, the largest island called Spitsbergen, of course. Um, we've had a viewer asking, best way to get to Svalbard and what would be the best tours to join when you get there? Uh, I'd like to take a little bit of help of Bruno there as well, but uh, you need to commute via Oslo or Tromsø <laughs> for your flight. And uh, Tromsø is in uh, northern Norway, obviously, and it's about one hour, 30 minutes from Tromsø straight to Longyearbyen, which is the capital of Svalbard. And uh, once you're there, uh, and if you want to see the northern lights, it's... Uh, practically the same time as goes for mainland Scandinavia. But Bruno, please fill me in there on 
on the best happenings in, in Svalbard as far as activities are concerned. Yeah, no, Don, uh, spot on The best way is to go via Oslo or via Tromsø. Um, in terms of UK airports, Manchester and Heathrow are possible, um, as is Gatwick now that Norwegian Air are flying again. Um, in terms of the best tours, Svalbard is very unique. It's somewhere that completely blew my mind um, when I visited. Uh, you have snowmobiling tours, dog sledding tours, but these are areas where once you leave, there's nothing. You know there's nothing in front of you until you'd hit the North Pole. Um, and over the other side, to be honest. Um, Svalbard started as a mining town. So there are tours where you can actually go down into one of the old mines, which is no longer used. And that mine is located next to the seed vault. So the seed vault is um, sort of every seed on earth is stored there in case of extinction or, or whatnot. Um, and it's very unique to Svalbard. Obviously, you're not allowed in, but you do go past it. So it's interesting to say you've seen it. Svalbard also has the world's northernmost brewery. Um, so they do beer tasting. Uh, there which is it's quite a unique thing as well but the the activities on Svalbard you've got yeah the snowmobiling the dog sledding but there's so much to do they also they even have champagne tasting at one of the hotels um the options are endless yeah it is it is an amazing place I mean um I remember when I went up there that the snowmobiling trip into the Advent Valley from Long Longyearbyen is just absolutely breathtaking i mean it's perhaps worth pointing out now i mean I, I mentioned it was minus 35 when i did that trip um on all these winter holidays to these locations way above the arctic circle um all most if not all of the places you stay at and the activities you do they will provide you with full polar suits boots thick mitts balaclavas if you're snowmobiling um so there's no need to worry about you, you getting cold. Uh, what I particularly like about the snowmobiling is the handlebars are heated. So even though you've got gloves and then thick, heavy mitts on over the top of that, you've also got a heated seat and a heated handlebar. Um, so though it's minus 35 plus wind chill, um, you still stay warm. Thanks, Bruno. That's fantastic. Um, we must get back out there. Um, next question. Um, Northern Lights, while you were with you, Bruno, um, have a reputation for being quite romantic, Northern Lights holidays, don't they? Perfect for couples, but I think they also make great family breaks. We've had a question from a viewer who wants to know specifically about activities that would keep teenagers happy. There's got to be loads, haven't there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm very fortunate in that my teenage years, I spent a lot of time going to Sweden, to the Ice Hotel, a lot of time in Iceland as well. Things like whale watching, I think it's for all ages. There's there's no sort of cut off at either end. Um, well, watching is is brilliant. Husky sledding as well. It depends on the age of the teenagers. The main thing is they have to be big enough to control the dogs and strong enough. As long as they are, you know, fifteen is not a problem. I drove my first dog sled at fifteen. Um, you know, not, again, it's an enjoyable activity that everyone's going to love. Um, snowmobiling, you have to have a driving license, a full driving license to drive these. But if uh, the teenagers have to sit on the back that's also you know it's a lot of fun i think a lot of the activities um they're not they're not just adult based um things like taking a super jeep into thorsmore valley uh near to hotel anger i first did that when i was 18 and i absolutely loved it it's like being on mars it's a completely different world um then combining that with for example finland ice fishing in the middle of the lake with no one around minus 20 but the sun shining down you again really enjoyed it so activities are there for teenagers and all ages to be honest yeah absolutely graham what about you what would you recommend for teenagers up in sweden or fa or children of any age for that matter yeah no we 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 see a lot of families um coming to to these resorts and and um i think teenagers are quite easy i think they enjoy teenagers today you know they enjoy um being outdoors and adventure and um uh, like their parents do. So I think teenagers are quite easy to take care of and the fun activities we enjoy, they enjoy. It's um, And all the way down, even teenagers, but all the way down to, you know, eight-year-olds is, is pretty easy. Most activities, when children are eight or younger, sometimes we have to take a little extra care of them when it's really cold, of course. And um, sometimes activities um, for, for younger kids might have to be adjusted a little bit for the, the cooler temperatures. But you know, we we all have children up here in the north, and they survive quite well. So we're pretty good at taking care of um, 
children of all ages up to teenagers in the in this climate so so they'll they'll have fun yeah, and yeah. what's amazing too is sometimes what i've seen i've actually seen families go to brandon lodge on occasions down to see your in there and the parents turn up and they've got a five-year-old a six-year-old and a nine-year-old and they say oh what are the kids going to do and before the parents have turned around the kids are off they're in the snow in their snow suits sliding down the hills on toboggans and you know they're gone for the rest of the holidays so the kids yeah. can have fun with a pile of snow so it's uh yeah it's pretty absolutely. easy i think yeah i remember we took our twins first time up there to finish lapland i think when they're about 10 and you're absolutely right they get the polar, snoo- polar suits on and they're, they're just out there yeah being snow angels playing with the kick sleds toboggans uh meeting there's obviously there's usually a reindeer farm they can go and visit nearby which yes. they absolutely love and and, yeah. and all that sort of thing and and of course if you add uh, a santa break into the equation um you know they're going to be very happy <laughs> it's a win-win. absolutely thanks graham um Saiva, this is an interesting question a sciencey one for you as our as our astrophysicist on the panel, I knew you'd like this one. Um, this, this is a, a good question. With all the beautiful colours you are blessed to see, is there a colour that doesn't appear and why? Uh, yeah, of course, there are multiple colours that don't appear, but that's just because of how energetic the particles are and the, uh, the chemicals or the atoms and molecules that are being excited to produce the lights. Uh, I don't often see bluish colors that much. So if I can answer the question in what we usually don't see, because of course we cannot see any, any uh, now no color comes, comes to mind actually, but, <laughs> but uh, for example, it's quite hard sometimes to see the, the red colors because they are quite faint and our eyes are not very adapted to actually see them. So our red, red auroras are quite hard to see visually, but they are easily picked up uh, with cameras, but bluish is something that I have hardly ever seen, and that's something rare. I would lo- really love to see, but the reason is mostly just the the atoms and molecules being excited and the energy being used. It just doesn't allow more colors to actually make an appearance. Mm. That's interesting. Thank you. And so, following on from that, you you touched on it a little bit there. Um, someone's asking, can you see the lights with the naked eye, or is it only a photo that gets this effect? Um. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes you really do see them as they look like in the picture. But for that to happen, of course, you need to be in the right spot at the right time. You need to have a geomagnetic storm taking place, which happens every now and then, especially when the sun is quite active. And shortly after uh, the sun solar maximum has been reached, um, the most vivid colors are mostly seen when we have these uh, dense clouds of plasma bombarding the Earth that you actually showed in your video or your presentation. But let's face it, our eyes will never really um, see them as they really look like in pictures. That's just because, because our eyes are, um, are not that sensitive to the faint colors that, that's most often seen. So, but you can see them really vividly and, and beautifully, but you need to be, you need to have like a geomagnetic storm taking place. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Saiva. Um, sort of connected with that, um, We've had lots of questions coming in about what is the most successful way to photograph the Northern Lights. And now, if you go to the Discover the World website and click on the blog, um, you can find a post covering this in quite a lot of detail. Um, Saiva, while you're there, um, what would be your top tips? I'll come to you. I'll come to the rest of you as well, actually, because I'm sure you've all um, photographed the Northern Lights, so had a crack at it. Um, what would be your top tips for photographing the Aurora? Uh, okay, three things for me at the top is one, patience. Hmm. Patience is a virtue when it comes to photographing the auroras. A good steady tripod and, of course, a good camera, be it a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera with some lens that's fast, like uh, f1.8, f2, f2.8, something like that. So, uh, but a good tripod is absolutely vital uh, because you usually have to... Have the, leave the aperture open for maybe a few seconds to really collect the light to actually see it. Mm-hmm. But then uh, be good at, or be skillful at actually um, editing your photos afterwards, because you can reduce the, for example, the saturation. I urge you to reduce the saturation because otherwise it looks like someone puked some radioactive material over your pictures. They all become some neon green stuff yeah. that people actually don't or hardly ever see. But yes, steady tripod, SLR camera, and patience. 
mm-hmm. and then you're good to go. And of course, northern lights in the sky. Mm-hmm. Graham, you mentioned your photo- photographic side of your business. What about your tips for photography? Yeah, I think um, the, the points that were just made were really, really valid. You need a good camera tripod and um, some northern lights and you're a long way there. It's obviously, you need to learn quickly and um, there's lots of places to find out the right shutter speeds and apertures and um, turning off your focus and those sorts of things. I think the biggest tip I have for people is that if you are lucky enough to be, see the northern lights and photograph them, then a bit like the photo behind you there, find, find a great um, uh, composition. So not just the northern lights, but have some reflection in the water as the photo is behind you, a beautiful mountain, you know, where Dan is at Senya, for example, make a feature out of the landscape as well as capturing the northern lights. And I think they're often much more beautiful in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good tip. Uh, Dan, how about you? Have you ever tried photographing northern lights? I'm sure you have. Uh, yes, uh, but I, I couldn't possibly add anything more than uh, what's been said already. Okay. Uh, and I particularly agree with uh, Graham. Uh, don't just ma- photograph the green sort of image on the sky. Put it into a landscape. And uh, by all means, if you want to show it to anyone when you come back, make sure it's uh, what's also a little bit real. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do marvelous tricks with your cameras these days, but uh, I, I, uh, I think the Northern Lights are beautiful enough as they are seen without tricking them too much. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dan. I, I, I'll just add a couple of things to that from my own experience. Um, yes, tripod, very important. Um, a camera, if it can shoot raw files, that's really important because you want to be able to post-process the pictures. Um, and the great thing about digital cameras nowadays is that you can open your camera wide open, as as Saiba was saying, to f2.8, f4, set your ISO to 1,000 and and start with a shutter speed of, say, 20 seconds. And then you can instantly review on the back of your camera whether that was underexposed or overexposed and tweak it and keep fiddling with the, the settings until you get the right exposure. So that's great. And then my final, my second tip would be, please, whatever you do, if you're lucky enough to see the Northern Lights, don't become too obsessed with fiddling around trying to take pictures. At least for most of the time, don't bother looking at your camera because you just never know when the Northern Lights are gonna fade away and stop dancing above your head. And if you spent the whole time frustrated trying to get your camera set up properly, um, you'll miss the magic of just being there in that moment, in that place, experiencing the magic of, of what's going on in the heavens above you. So. Uh, and I'm saying that as a photographer um, when I'm usually obsessed with fiddling around with my camera. <laughs> um, thank you very much, everyone, for that. I'm just, we're nearly running out of time. I just want to ask a couple more questions which have come through for Bruno. Um, do you offer any tours to Jokl Salen, um, which, for those of you who don't know, is the amazing iceberg lagoon in southern Iceland? Um, any Northern Lights trips out that way, Bruno? Um, yes, I think. The beauty of Iceland is you can self-drive around there any time of year. Um, Jokulsalon, uh, you can go and see all year. The boat trips, they only run until around mid-October. So the best time to really see it on a boat trip and also try and get the Northern Lights is September into uh, mid-October. Um, however, if you wanted to go there in November, December, it's definitely possible. You'll still be able to see Jokulsalon, um, and obviously the chance of the Northern Lights. I'd say it's good to stay there or nearby for a day or two. Um, it is quite a long way. If you're staying in Reykjavik, a round trip is going to be 15 to 16 hours. It is a it is a long way. So it's important to stay local as well. Okay, thank you. Another one for you, Bruno. Probably our last question for this evening. Um, someone has asked, I would like to find somewhere where there, there are either alerts as the lights are coming in um, or wake you if they come during the night. Any recommendations? So we talked about the Aurora wake-up calls at hotels like Ranga and Husafetla. Um, is that a widespread thing, or is it just those two properties? Um, it tends to be mostly in Iceland. Um, the Northern Lightning is another one, which is located close to the Blue Lagoon. Um, you do have, in Finland, a lot of the properties offer it at a small cost. I'd just like to sort of say a quick story. My uh, sister-in-law stayed um, at Mutka, which is in northern Finland, and she paid for the Northern Lights wake-up call. 
Um, apart from one night where it was cloudy when she went to bed, the clouds cleared about an hour later and it was the only night that the Northern Lights came out. So it is worth it. Um, if Northern Lights are a must, it is worth paying for the Aurora wake-up call. Um, the other place is Melangen in Northern Norway. They do a trip called the Northern Lights Watch, where you obviously start trying to see the lights and the guide will stay up and wake you if the lights come out once you've gone to bed. They're the main places, but it's more, more across the board in Iceland. Brilliant. Thanks, Bruno. Well, I think our time is almost up, I'm afraid. Um, I hope everyone joining us this evening has found it uh, useful and inspirational for, for planning your next Northern Lights holiday. Um, whether you're itching to get away as soon as possible or, or maybe thinking ahead for, for next year. Um, don't forget that Discover the World's flexibility promise gives you that crucial uh, financial security and peace of mind uh, when booking your holiday. Now, if you do have any questions about visiting any of the destinations we've covered this evening, please do call the experts at Discover the World um, to start tailor-making your holiday to suit your exact needs. I'd like to say a massive thank you to our panel, Dan, Graham, Saiva and Bruno um, for their brilliant words of wisdom. Um, and a special thank you to you too uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, keep safe, happy travels, fingers crossed that you see the aurora and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>